Interview Stefan Lanka. Challenging both mainstream and alternative AIDS views. By Mark Gabrish Conlon. Zengers. December 1998. While most people in the U.S. and Western Europe go right on believing that the so-called human immunodeficiency virus HIV is the sole cause of AIDS, debate rages even within the alternative AIDS community over whether HIV exists at all. Though Peter Duesberg, Ph.D., virtually the only alternative AIDS theorist with any significant public reputation, continues to insist that HIV exists but is harmless, other alternative AIDS researchers and activists are coming to the conclusion that the virus doesn't exist. The main proponents of this view are Australian researcher Eleni Papadopoulos Eliopoulos and her colleagues, who argue that HIV has never been isolated according to the Pasteur Institute criteria of 1973, and therefore it's probably what's called an endogenous retrovirus, a creation of the body's own genetic material that looks and functions partly like a virus, but is not an infection because it comes from the body's own cells. Stefan Lanka, Ph.D., takes the challenge to HIV's existence even further. A German researcher, Dr. Lanka is usually referred to as a virologist. But that hardly begins to describe his wide-ranging fields of study. Based on experiences in marine biology, biochemistry, evolutionary biology and virology, he's worked out a whole new view of HIV and AIDS. He believes that all so-called retroviruses are actually the body's own creations, that hepatitis is an autoimmune disorder, a disease in which the body is attacked by components of its own immune system, rather than a viral disease, that AIDS has nothing to do with immune suppression, and that it should really be called acquired energy deficiency syndrome AIDS, because its true cause is a breakdown in the delivery of oxygen to the blood and or body tissues. Dr. Lanka did a West Coast tour in October and spoke to HEAL San Diego on October 20th. Zengers. Interviewed him hours before that event. Zengers. I'd like a little about your background, what your training is, when you studied, what you specialized in, and essentially how you came to these ideas about AIDS. Stefan Lanka, Ph.D. I started studying molecular biology in 1984, and I soon got bored because I learned that all that you have to learn in order to pass the exams is already old, out-of-date dogmatic thinking. So I went into ecology because I realized, while being abroad in different countries, that you can carry out very important research without big machines or big money. I was looking for an opportunity to do molecular genetics in the field of biology, so I chose to move into marine biology and did a lot of electron microscopic studies. A marine biology professor was willing to let me work for him, and while doing this, I found a stable virus-host relationship by accident. In that very moment, I knew that was it. The best way to do meaningful genetic research is to have a stable virus-host relationship, in which a virus is produced in the host, but does not kill the host. So you can really study how they interact, how the genetic material of the virus is produced and how it interacts with the host, without manipulating it. That's still the only stable virus-host relationship in virology, other than in bacteria. I was glad to be able to carry out this study. But first I had to convince my professor so he would agree to finance my new studies. He said he was a classical biologist and he could not sponsor me as a researcher in virology. I needed to find another professor who was willing to guide me, and the very day I found one I got a lab of my own. I could buy all the tools and big machines on my own overtime, so I had the best conditions to start my studies. After one year, I had isolated a virus and characterized it. When I started doing viral research, it was already 1986, 1987, just when the public in Germany and Europe was starting to become aware of AIDS. Because AIDS was supposedly caused by a virus, I was automatically considered a specialist in the AIDS field. In the beginning, this was a nice feeling. I was telling people what I heard from the mass media and the TV, and I was not checking the evidence because everybody was convinced AIDS was a viral disease. 
Then I heard about the things that Robert Gallo, American cancer researcher who first identified HIV as the cause of AIDS, was doing wrong, and that he was misleading the public about his first retrovirus HTLVI, which Gallo claimed to be the cause of AIDS in 1982. Before his alleged discovery of HIV and he had stolen the virus from Montagne and all this kind of gossip, I already had a somewhat critical attitude when I started studying molecular genetics. So I went to the library to look up the literature on HIV. To my big surprise, I found that when they are speaking about HIV they are not speaking about a virus. They are speaking about cellular characteristics and activities of cells under very special conditions. I was so deeply shocked. I was thinking, well, I'm not experienced enough. I have overlooked something. On the other side, those people are absolutely sure. Then I was afraid that speaking about this with my friends, or even my family, they would think is absolutely mad and crazy. So for a long time I studied virology, from the end to the beginning, from the beginning to the end, to be absolutely sure that there was no such thing as HIV. And it was easy for me to be sure about this because I realized that the whole group of viruses to which HIV is said to belong, the retroviruses as well as other viruses which are claimed to be very dangerous, in fact do not exist at all. Zengers. So it was just on the basis of this reading that you concluded that what is called HIV, what is considered to be the HIV virus and is supposed to be infectious like other viruses that are acknowledged pathogens, really represented a phenomenon within the body. How did you figure that out, and why are you so sure about it? Dr. Lanka, I was wondering what viruses are for an evolution, because they didn't seem to have any function other than to be very dangerous and killing other cells. So I went into evolutionary biology and found that the first genetic molecule of life was RNA, and only later in evolution did DNA come into existence. Every one of our genomes, and that of higher plants and animals, is the product of so-called reverse transcription, RNA transcribed into DNA. But I had already realized already by then that the thinking about molecular genetics was very dogmatic. In the early 1960s they came up with the central dogma of molecular genetics, which try to uphold even today and which is ridiculous. The dogma says that DNA behaves in a static way. DNA makes RNA. RNA cannot be transcribed back into DNA. RNA comes into existence only on the basis of DNA. That was and is the basis of the central dogma of molecular genetics. I found that this kind of thought came from research funded by the seed producing industry of the United States and at a whole body of existing knowledge, namely that of cytogenetics before World War II was just suppressed or even slandered as lazy science because it had been carried out mostly in Europe. This kind of science well established that the genetic material is not stable. It is subject to change and this means the genetic material is reverse transcribed, it goes in both directions. This earlier research also established that inside the cell we have a huge amount of genetic material other than that of the nucleus. But because molecular genetics and molecular biology were actually founded by physicists who thought they could explain the whole structure of the atom just by focusing on the nucleus, when they went into biology they carried over that same mistake. They focused only on the nucleus of the cell and claimed it was responsible for all of how life comes into existence, how it's controlled, etc. This is ridiculous because they have overlooked the essential of life, the production of energy. While studying the evolutionary aspects of biology, I quickly realized that reverse transcription is common to all forms of life and in fact is the basis of all higher living. Later I learned that reverse transcription is a repair mechanism for chromosomal DNA.